Dr. Sibibor, we can introduce. Hello. Good evening, everyone. At the outset, let me thank the K4 Reproductive Committee and the Kotayam ONG Society for inviting me as chairperson for this session. Our next talk is newer drugs in PCOS. The speaker is Dr. Abhi Kyoshi, consultant in reproductive medicine and surgery, Sunrise Assisted Reproduction Center, Sunrise Hospital, Cochin, Kerala. He is a graduate of Government Medical College, Kotayam, residency in ONG at Armed Forces Medical College, Pune, in the year 2004, and gold medalist from University of Pune. Awarded the DNB in 2005 and became a member of the RCOG in 2008. Advanced training in reproductive medicine at Homerton University Hospital, London, UK. Worked as an IVF specialist in three different hospitals in India and abroad. Published 12 articles in peer-reviewed indexed journals and contributed seven chapters in different books. Peer reviewer to nine international and national journals. And the topic is newer drugs in PCOS. And we are all familiar with the metformin, myo-inositol and d inositol orally stat and combined OC pills in the treatment of PCOS. And today we are going to listen to this eminent speaker, Dr. Abhi Kyoshi for the newer drugs and management of PCOS. Over to Dr. Abhi Kyoshi. I can you a little more louder, please? I thank all the organizers who have invited me for this talk, and I hope it's beneficial for all of you listeners. Thank you. So PCOS is not just a single disease. It is a disease spectrum, and uh, it has multiple problems which occur at different times and at different age groups in different ways and has to be managed accordingly. The management is primarily by lifestyle changes which we always undermine and it does come in different ways from different specialists. But my talk will be to focus on the areas of medical management, which could be related to the cycle control, skin and hair related issues, infertility, metabolic problems, and malignancies and pre-malignancies of the uterus. Now my talk will be broadly into two different groups. One is the new drugs, which are in PCOS or the application of new drugs in PCOS. And the second one is new evidence regarding existing medications. I've also taken this second area because the new drugs are quite limited and uh, you know, not be right to just limit me in that particular area. Now the first group of medicines, and in fact all the new medicines which I'll be talking about are primarily drugs which came into the management of diabetes but is now being also being tried for the management of polycystic ovarian syndrome. And that is because, as we all know, there's a lot of overlap between not just clinical symptoms, but also a lot of biochemical problems behind polycystic ovarian syndrome. Now, Abhi, sorry to interrupt. Your voice is a bit low. Okay. Volume is too low. Can you hear me now? No, no. The previous one is better, Doctor. Maybe I had set my ticket low. Okay, I'll just go directly. I think you can yeah, hear me now. Yeah, this is better. Yeah, 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 better. Right. So, the first group of medicines is glucagon-like peptide one receptor agonists. Uh, as you know, these are medicines which are primarily used in diabetes, and they work primarily uh, on the gut, the gut hormones to be specific, and 
the GLP-1 uh, works primarily by stimulation of insulin secretion, inhibition of glucagon secretion, and this leads to suppression of food intake and appetite, which leads to improved glucose homeostasis. Now, all these things will improve the diabetic profile, but also manages the obesity part of things also. Now, there are two molecules which have been tried. One is exenitide, which is an older one, and then there is rilaglutide, which is a newer molecule. The first study was on exenitide in 2008, and the further studies have been on liraglutide after that, which is the most uh, researched molecule now, and that is the more commonly available one also. The areas where these molecules have been studied is in the field of weight loss, improvement of menstrual frequency, and also with reduction in hyperandrogenism. Now, what these studies have shown is that there is a significant reduction in BMI, which is similar to what we see in the diabetic population. And also, this is primarily by improvement in the eating behavior, and that is what has been assessed by eating questionnaires. But in terms of data and looking at the change in body fat distribution, improvement in menstrual cycle, and changes in insulin resistance and testosterone levels, the, the data has been a bit inconsistent. And therefore, others have also tried combining these molecules with metformin, and they says that it might be slightly better. In the field of IVF, there has been one small study which has shown that low dose of liraglutide will improve the outcome of IVF treatment in obese patients with PCOS. Now, there have been some concerns regarding these studies. One is most of these studies have been on small sample sizes. Only overweight and obese women were enrolled. And we don't know whether the results are primarily because of weight loss or is it because of the effect of the drug. There have been other concerns also in terms of drug administration. Like nausea is very common, therefore compliance is poor. The treatment is primarily by a parental route of administration and the medicine is costly. So we should still consider this treatment as more or less experimental. The next and the second set is a DPP4 inhibitors, which stands for the dipeptidyl peptidase 4 enzyme being inhibited. The mechanism of action is more or less the same. So you're still having improvement in insulin secretion and also in the release of glucagon. You must be familiar with many of these molecules because you would see the endocrinologist prescribing them for the treatment of diabetes. So what you see on the left hand of the slide is the other ones which are commonly available now, whereas the one on the right are still in the pipeline. And citagliptin is a molecule which has been studied the most extensively in women with polycystic ovarian syndrome. Now, citagliptin is available as Genuvia, and uh, it has shown that it has improved the beta cell function, leading to a prevention of women going to pre-diabetes and diabetes, especially in those who are metformin intolerant. It decreases visceral fat and blood glucose and improves ovarian cycles and ovulation. It can also improve the maturation of oocytes and embryo quality more effectively than metformin in those women who are going ICSI treatment. The third group of people are the molecule is the SGLT in two inhibitors. The sodium glucose co-transponder 2 is found in the proximal tubules in the kidneys. And this accounts for the glucose reabsorption in blood. Blocking this leads to glycosuria and better diabetic control. These five molecules are the ones which are available in the market and though primarily used for control of diabetes has been tried in polycystic ovarian syndrome also. But small studies have shown that it does improve body weight and body composition, especially in the overweight obese class of women with PCOS compared to metformin. But the data has not shown any improvement in the hormonal or metabolic parameters. Fifth molecule or group is Olistat, which you are probably familiar with. This is a lipase inhibitor and recent data has shown that other than helping with weight loss, it does improve the testosterone levels, insulin resistance and lipid profile. So it might be more useful in women who have these problems. Now statins as a group of molecules is a very, very old class of drugs. 
And what has been found is that we are getting more and more data showing that it might be useful in women with polycystic ovarian syndrome. That is because it inhibits the enzyme HMG-CoA reductase, which is responsible for the production of cholesterol, which is exactly the precursor for sex steroids. So women on statins show an improvement in hyperandrogenemia. And in spite of this, there's not much of difference in the menstrual cycles or ovulation. And though there is an improvement in insulin sensitivity in some people, the general recommendation is not to give statins primarily as a treatment for androgen excess in women with polycystic ovaries. But as a clinician, you should understand that people who have been on statins alone or with metformin do show an improvement in many parameters, and that is important for us to understand. Now, let me talk about what is new with the coexist the existing molecules. And I'll start with the good old metformin, which like a pendulum has been swinging up and down for a very long time. Now, if you look at the data, there's not much of change in what metformin is doing or how effective metformin is. It is just how people are interpreting metformin in different studies, in more subgroups to get a better idea about where exactly metformin might be useful in. But as a broad view on metformin, I must tell you that it does make a difference in many parameters, but don't expect too much from metformin. And that is where we all go wrong. We expect that metformin might do wonders, but it will never do. And also there's a shift towards understanding how metformin works in changing the metabolic alterations and improving insulin resistance and helping in the long-term treatment of these women. The first question a lot of people ask is, does metformin add to diet and exercise in losing weight and improving PCOS? Now, seven RCTs as part of this study showed that it does not. And the quality of study is reasonably good because there is low to moderate risk of bias. But when you look at a lot of other parameters, even though the evidence is weaker, we know that metformin does improve testosterone levels, cholesterol, triglycerides. There's some benefit for BMI, especially in the 25 plus BMI group. And in the less than 25 group, the waist tip ratio tends to improve also. But let me remind you, the data is not that good. For acne alopecia and hirsutism, that is androgen excess, the data has been inconsistent and metformin should not be used as a first-line treatment in such patients. So, to summarize, metformin can be considered in women with PCOS to improve weight, hormonal, and metabolic parameters. But it should be strongly considered in women with BMI more than 25 with these problems. In women with infertility, the Cochrane data, though the evidence being low, has suggested that it does improve menstrual pattern, ovulation rate, and clinical pregnancy rate. And could be added in women with clonophene, letrozole, and gonadotropins to improve outcomes. In IVF, its primary role is to reduce the risk of hyperstimulation, but also does improve the clinical pregnancy rate marginally. In metabolic disease, the data is quite poor because again, it's very difficult to study all these parameters in big population studies. But if a person's BMI is more than 25, it should be considered, especially because we are getting more data that it does improve endothelial function and systemic inflammation. In pregnancy, the quality of evidence is poor, but it's a safe option. So you could try to reduce the chance of early pregnancy loss. But its role in preventing hypertension or gestational diabetes has not been confirmed. Metformin is some, a drug with adverse effects which are common, especially of the GI tract. So you should start with a 500 milligram dose and gradually increase to 1000. Though higher doses might be needed in controlling diabetes and blood sugars, its role in improving other parameters more than 1000 milligram is not based on strong evidence. Sustained release or controlled release preparations are better tolerated than the instant release preparations. And because of this concern regarding tolerability, new molecules which might be given vaginally are in the pipeline. As a group, thiazolidine ions have been tried extensively by many of us. And pyoglutasone does not show much improvement in the menstrual pattern or other outcomes, especially when it was compared with metformin. Rosiglotisone was better, but 
because of the concerns regarding adverse effects and also because it being a category C medication, its widespread use has come down. Another molecule which we are very familiar with is N-acetylcysteine, which is more commonly given as a mucolytic drug, especially by our ENT and respiratory medicine colleagues. Like metformin, it reduces testosterone and androgen levels and increases insulin sensitivity. So most of the studies are small. A meta-analysis has shown that it does improve pregnancy and ovulation rates. But in other parameters, it's not really very much better than metformin. Also because studies are small and short term, and because of the trial quality was poor, and in the absence of studies with ERP, if a woman tolerates metformin might be a better option compared to NSF-insisting. In the next few slides, I'll be taking data from these two studies, which we'll be discussing later on during this session today also. But let me come to combined OCPs. Now, the recommendation is that women with PCOS who have androgen excess and irregular cycles, the drug of choice is combined OCPs. And it should not be drugs which contain ciproterone as a first line. So go with your regular OCPs first, because you are concerned about the thromboembolic risk with your ciproton acetate containing OCPs. Also in adolescents, and even in adolescents who are at risk of being diagnosed with PCOS, you can consider OCPs to regularize cycles. It is important to understand that we are not talking about any supplements or metformin as a first-line treatment. It is always OCPs. And when prescribing OCPs, you should start with ones which are of low dose. And you should also keep in mind about the guidelines when you are giving OCPs because we have to look at individual contraindications and other problems which the patient might have. Adding metformin in women with OCP should be considered in the management when metabolic features predominate and there are strong risk factors for diabetes or high at risk ethnic groups and in women and girls with high BMI, especially when OCPs alone don't make us reach the goals of treatment. Adding anti-androgen should not be also considered in the first six months unless you have a strong androgen-related alopecia. In terms of the regular anti-androgens, flutamide, finasteride, and spironolactone, unfortunately, we don't have too much of new data coming, so I'll be skipping that. In terms of treatment for infertility, I'll be quickly going through two slides. One, letrozole is considered the first-line treatment now. It gives you better results. It has less multiple pregnancy. Whenever it is available, it should be before the low flow No more is better than leaving metformin alone, but is inferior to letrozole, but it is more widely available. And considering that body follicular growth is higher with flow it would be better that it is monitored by ultrasound. In terms of gonadotrophins for ovulation induction, it could be used primarily as a second line treatment, but in rare cases, it can be considered as a first line treatment. Whether you give urinary gonadotrophins or a component, the treatment outcomes are the same. Also, the same applies to IVF also. No specific molecule is recommended. Recombinant LH is not recommended routinely. You should always go for an antagonist protocol as a routine. If there is a risk for OHSs, consider an agonist trigger and freeze all the embryos. The role of metformin is primarily to reduce hyperstimulation, but does improve embryo outcomes in other parameters also to a smaller extent. Finally, I'll be talking about the big, big world of supplements, very commonly given by doctors as well as self-medicated by a lot of patients also. I'll start with the big boy, inositols. Now, summarizing in a couple of slides, what you need to understand is that the Cochrane review showed that there is an improvement in ovulation rate, but in all of the parameters, there's hardly any evidence to show that things do improve. And also, a recent meta-analysis showed that its use in IVF did not improve outcomes. Alpha lipoic acid, or ALA, is a very commonly prescribed and uh, supplement in the West, and it's primarily an antioxidant, but it has shown that it improves insulin sensitivity and also works with the GLUT1 and 4 transporters in the gut, improving outcomes. But in terms of PCOS, the studies are small, as you can see in the numbers. And though the improvement in parameters like triglyceride levels, insulin sensitivity, and menstrual frequency has been documented, the data is still quite weak. And combinations of ALA with metformin has also been tried, but with inconsistent results. 
omega 3 fatty acids widely used you all know about since biochemistry so i'll be skipping it but what we have is multiple small studies on different aspects of pcos like inflammation insulin resistance and other things and those some of them show parameters where things have improved we need more trials to really say that this is something which is very useful Vitamin D is something which has been over tested and over treated in the last five six years, but we have fairly decent data to show that it does have a significant role in polycystic ovaries also. It might be an independent predictor of insulin resistance, and there is some data to show that by giving it, you do improve the insulin resistance and other parameters also. Bioflavonoids, multiple compounds, multiple molecules usually available as combinations again we have only small studies which show some improvement in metabolic syndrome and lipid profile each of these five minerals calcium chromium magnesium selenium and zinc have been studied but again small underpowered study studies we really have don't have good data to routinely recommend it for our patients with pcos another strong push has been coming regarding melatonin it's a neuroendocrine hormone from the pineal gland. And there is some data to show that it might improve suicide quality and pregnancy rate. But I said it might. And its administration might improve IVF and other clinical parameters. But we need bigger studies and good data. Probiotics have been tried in many, many different problems. And now they have tried it in PCOS also. And small studies have showed that it does improve weight, sugars, insulin, triglycerides. In some studies, but in others, it has showed no difference. To summarize, if you look at this good meta analysis, which has looked into many of these molecules, there's no high quality evidence to support the effectiveness of nutritional supplements and herbal medicine for women with PCOS, and the evidence regarding safety is also lacking. So, we need high quality studies and better data before we actually recommend it to our patients, especially when we need to understand that these are expensive and giving medicines which don't have good data over a long term and especially when you're considering safety also is not very good medical practice so that concludes my talk thank you very much for your patient hearing dr sibibol please unmute yourself Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Abhi, for that interesting presentation. He has described the different aspects of treatment of PCOS. And the, now the topic is open for discussion. New strategies of treatment of PCOS. This question is to Dr. Abhi Koshi. And uh, I think he has described all the aspects of treatment. And uh, anything more to add, Dr. Abhi? Well, I would like to emphasize that if there is not a contra contraindication, uh, you should primarily think about using OCPs, which are actually very effective. Unfortunately, we have a tendency in Kerala to think about OCPs as purely hormones, and our patients are really scared about hormones. So don't use those words inappropriately. Tell them that these are things which your body is normally producing. We are just giving even small dosages to make things better. And if you explain it to your patients, you will really find that your patients are very, very compliant with treatments and they get excellent results. Compared to all these nutritional supplements which are available, none of them will give you the good quality of results which you get there. And I feel quite uh, odd when we get patients saying that, look, with a senior doctor or senior gynecologist has told them that don't take this medicine for over a year because you might develop cancer or some other problem. So all these things need to come out and we as doctors should really improve our practice in this particular area so that we could give good quality care to our patients. Thank you, Dr. B. And the next question is to Dr. Elizabeth. How can we genetically substantiate PCOS? I didn't understand what it actually meant. If it's about what uh, are the different genetic predispositions that ultimately lead on to the epigenetic change, it is considered to be polygenetic. Polymorphism in the genetic subset occurs and that finally leads on to the epigenetic manifestations. I'm not aware of a specific gene or uh, that has been detected that explains the substantiation of PCOS. 
Thank you, madam. And uh, next question again to Dr. Elizabeth, how to screen for CA endometrium and how frequently? Okay. As such, both the ISHRI and the ASRM do not actually routinely recommend screening for uh, CA endometrium in PCOS women. So it will be the same charges that we are setting, that is in the perimenopausal women with an ET of more than 12 and in a postmenopausal woman with an ET of more than 6 mm or 5 mm, uh, we have to screen, uh, we have to do an endometrial biopsy in these women. Of course, if there is additional risk factors in the terms of obesity, in the terms of abnormal uterine bleeding, persistent uh, prolonged bleeding, these women, we should have a lower threshold in order to uh, take her for an endometrial biopsy and to confirm that she is not suffering from atypical hyperplasia or endometrial malignancy. But it's been specifically mentioned that there is no role for routine screening of these women for endometrial malignancy. So I think that should be the standard of practice. Thank you, madam. And what medication should be given to regularize the cycle, progesterone or OCP? I it would be prefer it, it is I've been mentioned that it is preferable to use the progesterones in order to regularize the cycle in these women in the mid-cycle, in, in the midlife phase uh, for correcting the abnormal uterine bleeding. Okay, madam. Thank you. And the next question to Dr. Abhi. Can metformin be of any use in midlife PCO to control PCOD? Definitely, we are seeing an epidemic of obesity, pre-diabetes and diabetes in our patients. And after a lockdown, you know how much people have gained weight. I see most of my patients have gained 5 to 10 kgs in the last one year. And many of us have also. So I suppose we would be seeing more and more use for metformin as part of treatment. And metformin, the big advantage is it's quite commonly available. It is cheap. Unlike many of these molecules which I have explained where the cost of prohibitive Can I just make a point about that? Uh, as far as uh, the, I think the question was uh, uh, to control PCOD, would you advise giving metformin? What the evidence says is actually in patients in whom impaired glucose tolerance has been detected, those are the women in whom you can advocate giving P uh, metformin to delay or arrest the progression to type 2 diabetes. But primarily, evidence is not supporting the routine use of metformin to prevent uh, IGT or um, uh, type 2 diabetes from occurring. So I don't know whether in midlife, as such, any recommendation has come up which says you can put them on metformin to actually uh, prevent uh, the metabolic consequences. Though definitely we are aware that met, uh, metformin uh, improves the lipid profile, uh, is good for glycemic control, but to control PCOD in midlife routinely, uh, metformin has not been recommended as of now. Okay, should we use metformin for all PCOS women undergoing IVF? Next question. It's a not a very standard practice. I mean, everybody doesn't use metformin, uh, primarily because uh, uh, most doctors, you know, are still not convinced by the data that it improves pregnancy rates significantly. Okay. Okay. Uh, Second thing is there is a lot of uh, people who have issues with taking metformin uh, in terms of tolerability also, especially people of clean BMI. So if the patient does tolerate or has been on metformin, we don't just routinely discontinue it during IVF, but starting it afresh just because she is going for a PCOS is not a very common practice, but again, there is no contraindication and the data shows that there is some small but significant improvement in this. There's no harm. Thank you, Dr. B. And the next question, Cyproteron or high-dose estrogen, is it harmful for thromboembolic episode? So we are getting more data about uh, uh, CPA having uh, increases for venous thromboembolism, but then you need to look into the data primarily coming from the West where as such, thromboembolism is much more common. Uh, but what the uh, guidelines are trying to sort of push is that if you have cycle control and androgen excess as the primary reason why you are giving OCP, the data is that uh, giving a standard OCP containing 20 to 25 of estrogen and uh, any of the progesterone, the older ones or the new ones, you will still get a very good control over the skin manifestations. That means hair loss, you are talking about the acne as well as hirsutism if your patient is taking it on the long run. 
Also, from an Indian point of view, the cost of a regular OCP can be less than 100 rupees. Whereas, if you are taking one with CPA, you are looking at 300 to 400 rupees. So, there is a big difference in cost also. So, when you have the guidelines, economics, and the availability in your favor, why go for something which is not that good? Or you are concerned about a risk. But there is no absolute contraindication. If you find that your patients don't improve with your regular OCPs, you can definitely shift over to uh, something like diet, and you do get better results in certain patients. But long-term use is definitely needed. You have to tell your patient that you are taking at least six months, but more likely one to two years before you can see very good results. Okay, thank you. The next question, DCI use or misuse, considering cost and bleak evidence, why don't we stick to metformin in indicated cases? Well, nobody is promoting metformin. That is a problem. <laughs> and the last question, please opine about safety of OCP in midlife regarding VTE and the breast cancer risk. In midlife, uh, there has not been a strong evidence to suggest that uh, there is an increased risk of breast or ovarian cancer. But of course, in the midlife, it would be definitely preferable to, to avoid using oral contraceptive pills and going for progesterone to regularize the periods. And if at all we need to use it for uh, breakthrough bleeding or irregular bleeding, it would be preferable to use the low dose preparations. Uh, as far as uh, oral contraceptive pills is concerned. But uh, definitely it is preferable to use the progesterones in order to control the abnormal uterine bleeding during the midlife. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Thank you. I think there are no more questions. Dr. Raju, 